hear from Andrew Haynes, the Chief Executive Officer of the Civil Aviation Authority. He joined the CAA after a wide-ranging career in the rail industry. Good God. As a Managing Director of Southwest Trains, he led the company to becoming Train Operator of the Year before heading up the rail division for First Group, which became Britain's largest and most profitable train operating business. He's going to talk about the regulatory and airspace policies that allow capacity enhancement to be funded and operated by the airlines. One told, difficult job after another. And I'm told you're a big fan of the uh, Scottish Sleeper I service, all the time. which I used to run. Good. Um, so thank you. The CEA you may well know as uh, the economic and safety and airspace regulator uh, in the UK. Uh, latterly, uh, we've also gained consumer enforcement powers. And very recently, we've gathered new, a new duty to publish information of uh, value to consumers and to citizens, both on consumer issues and environment. And in fact, uh, just this week, we published in proposals on how we will make uh, statistics on noise more accessible, uh, transparent and available to the ordinary consumers. And having sat here today, I think I've really reinforced for me the importance of that. I think if we've done nothing else today, and it has been a great conference, we've probably coined a new phrase, lies, damned lies, and aviation statistics. <laughs> Um, because there's so many conflicting views on exactly the same data. So I think transparency of information is going to be very key going forward. The consumer is at the heart of almost all we do as a regulator. It's at the heart of our legislation, and this focus does give us a unique approach to the Airport Commission. So the first thing I ought to say is that we agree with the Commission's assessment that additional cap runway capacity is necessary to avoid consumers suffering in future for higher prices, less choice, worse punctuality, and weaker resilience. And we support the conclusion that in the next 15 years at least, it is unlikely that passengers will be prepared to pay for more than one runway in the UK. Now, some of the issues I talked about in terms of congestion uh, and uh, less choice and value are already starting to affect us, but we see that ramping up rapidly towards the end of the next decade. So if I touch on two issues about economic regulation and then airspace. On economic regulation, it hopefully goes without saying uh, that whatever gets built will need to be paid for. And barring legislative changes, that will mean the CEA will be involved in overseeing expenditure and that will be privately funded. In other words, again, the passenger will pay for it. Unlike any of the other airports that have been mentioned by any of the speakers here so far today. I'm not going to touch on the sources of private finance because fundamentally I don't believe that is the key issue. There is no obvious shortage of new investors in UK airports. We've seen European, Far Eastern, Australasian, North American and Middle Eastern investment in recent years alone. For the CAA, the key issue is the market. What is the value to passengers? How much will they be prepared to pay when faced with alternatives in mainland Europe? Uh, uh, or other locations to fly from and to. So, following changes introduced in the Civil Aviation Act 2012, the CEA first has to assess whether or not an airport has significant market power, and if it does, whether economic regulation is the, in the best interest of passengers, and then, if so, what form should it take? Now, at present, the two airports on the shortlist, Heathrow and Gatwick, are economically regulated by the CEA, and uh, thank you, Joe Valentine, for your excellent plug this morning. Uh, last week, we announced our final view relating to regulation at both those airports after April this year. One question has been whether we will allow spending on developing proposals for the airport commission to be passed through to airlines and ultimately to passengers. Our position on this is that the two existing airports will not be able to recover their initial spend on developing their proposals through their charges to airlines. This ensures that the risk of nugatory spending lies with the airport and its shareholders, and hopefully news uh, which will be welcomed by Jock Lowe if nobody else, as that's the only shortlisted option not from a regulated airport. Now, once the Airport Commission has published its final report and the government has responded, the challenge will be considering how development is funded, and we've committed to consulting later this year on a statement of policy on how we would approach regulating development of that additional capacity. Typically, uh, airport regulation has allowed airports to recover infrastructure costs as expenditure is incurred, rather than when the runway is open or the new terminal is open. That provides certainty for investors, it lowers the cost of capital, 
to reduce the overall cost of the project, but it does mean that passengers might be paying for investment 10 years before it comes online. Now, for that approach to be successful, we need to be pretty confident that the proposed development is affordable. That is a calculation based on the true cost of the scheme and the number of passengers it can really be expected to attract. And of course, the last thing we want to see is a new runway scheduled to the point that resilience is damaged, causing the same problems for passengers that Heathrow suffers today. So planning assumptions must be built with resilience as a critical component. Now, Howard Davis, first thing this morning, made it clear that in the UK, there are no levers to force airlines to use one location over another. And forecasting passenger demand is an art, not a science, as Bjorn has just made clear. So there's always a chance of infrastructure passing muster at the first phase, but turning out to be a white elephant. And that's why we will be cautious about which schemes we allow to recover costs. For instance, let's go back to the 2003 white paper prediction of a need for a second runway at Stansted. I believe it serves as a cautionary tale. An airport that is today operating at around half of its potential capacity would by now have a second runway open if plans had gone ahead. And make no mistake about it, the cost of that runway will not have been borne by the Treasury, will not have been borne by shareholders, it will have been borne by passengers, and they will have paid for that abortive and necessary infrastructure. Another key consideration is going to be airlines' willingness to pay for infrastructure development that could lead to benefits for their rivals. Our concern must be what is best for passengers, both now and in the future, in taking these decisions. Generally, airlines' views are representative of their passengers, but not always. But should we be expecting existing passengers and airlines to contribute to new air capacity for new airlines and new passengers? And if so, to what extent? There is also then a decision about the balance of risk between shareholders and passengers. Taking higher risks means accepting shareholders of both downside and upside potential. So funded infrastructure today may lead to gains tomorrow. Getting all of this right is going to be pretty critical and it needs a strong understanding of consumer demand to effectively assess proposed expenditure. But it will also be vital for the shortlisted schemes and the Commission to ensure that understanding what passengers really want, at what price, is at the heart of their work as we reach a single recommended proposal. And as I said, our consultation later this year will set out our view on the role of the regulator in this area. So if I move on to airspace, um, it's another key area where the CA is likely to be asked to take judgments as one of the schemes becomes uh, a firmer reality. And that's a, it's a, airspace is a critical factor, obviously. Now, when looking at the short and medium term options, the interim report highlighted the importance of the CA's future airspace strategy to enhance resilience, reduce stacking, increase fuel efficiency and improve punctuality. We agree with that critical focus on the importance of FAS and welcome the attempt to speed the work up. In the end, though, progress will come down to industry and political's appetite to move, and to date that has been varied, with strong support from some quarters, but not universal. Because in the UK's disaggregated, privatised, competitive aviation sector, there are limited levers to force the industry to advance these issues, and some may well say quite rightly so, if they don't see a reason to prioritise it. But we do believe a compelling pace case can be made for major London airports and airlines to throw their weight behind FAS. Now, providing those airspace improvements occur and subject again to not overschedule new, new capacity, we don't see an insuperable airspace management challenges for any of the three currently shortlisted long-term schemes, providing they form part of a fundamental redesign of UK airspace. But that's not to say there won't be other challenges. Along with virtually every other speaker today, our strong view is that the environmental impact of aviation through noise has been the single largest stumbling block for the many previous proposals to develop capacity in the southeast. And noise is essentially an airspace issue, as I think Jock probably very clearly demonstrated to people earlier on this afternoon. But it's one that is deeply influenced by clear political considerations. Now, considering the three shortlisted proposals, it's possible to identify three potentially competing approaches to management of noise issues. First, we have the third runway proposal from uh, HAL, and here we see new people negatively impacted by noise at the new location of the runway, but in a way that still allows respite at set periods through alternating runways. And we know that respite is a big issue for many in, the, uh, in West London. 
then there's the Heathrow Hub proposal, which exposes far fewer new people to noise nuisance and reduces the impact of noise at night and early morning, but then means that there's limited alternation of runways and respite for the affected population is then significantly impacted. The Gatwick proposals, of course, impact far fewer people than either Heathrow scheme. That's a clear positive, uh, though it's a much more rural area, as again Stewart demonstrated in his, uh, in his pictures, where it's been argued new noise produces a very much greater impact for those uh, who suffer the disturbance. Now, interestingly, weighing up these conflicting approaches to tackling noise has previously been a role for government. The government has retained those decisions for itself. With the creation of the Commission and their proposal for an independent aviation noise authority, politicians could be moving themselves further from decision-making on noise, which will undoubtedly remain a political, politically sensitive issue within constituencies close to airports. But it's not the new noise authority, but the Commission itself that will decide both between different approaches and the relative weighting given to local impacts versus the other uh, evaluation criteria. And it's perhaps understandable that Howard didn't this morning touch on what I think is actually the nub of his job, evaluating the distinction between local impact and broader economic value, both to uh, society and to <coughs> consumers. The airport commission's process may reduce the political impact of noise, they certainly put a much greater onus on bodies who do not face the electorate to tackle the issues in a transparent, open fashion that allows at least sufficient, if not universal, consensus, let's be realistic, to develop around the proposed way forward. This could be a big step forward, but provided that, it, that what doesn't happen is that late in the process, politics and political externalities does not become the overriding consideration. The understandable local and national political considerations, especially at Heathrow, means this is going to be a tough call for any government to take in an era of marginal politics. So briefly to conclude, the Airport Commission have published their assessment criteria today, and we believe focusing on the following areas will help to narrow their shortlist to a single option. Fundamentally, the scheme must be driven by consumer demand. There must be a clear financing proposition it has to be operationally safe, and it simply has to be environmentally sustainable. There needs to be a credible message. Now, in today's session, I focused on practical issues that we face uh, that touch on each of those criteria. Uh, while the issues I've raised may seem a long way off right now and rather parochial, uh, and nothing like as grandiose uh, and as expansionist as, uh, as, as the big propositions, if we don't consider them before we choose a scheme, as the options are narrowed, we risk ruling a proposal in that will perhaps in practice not be deliverable or vice versa. Now we understand that as we go through this process there may well be a proposal that is on paper best but in practice unrealistic and we're very conscious of the danger of letting the best be the enemy of the good. But the last thing the CEA wants is to have to put our hand up in two or three years time and say actually this simply isn't going to work. Avoiding that scenario would mean that we tackle these complex issues soon before we decide a final scheme, but in doing so, we hopefully leave ourselves with a proposal that's stronger for it. Thank you. Question for the CAA. Yes, a question there. A hand up. Yep, fire away. Andrew, thank you for that. Uh, Laurie Price, uh, All Party Aviation Group Advisor. Um, you talked a lot about the CAA's new role with consumers and championing consumer calls. Do you see the CAA taking over any of the DFT's roles of oversight to secure public service obligation routes to get or to ensure that we maintain the network of connectivity from the UK regions, which has been so lost over the last 20 years? We used to have 21 routes at the Heathrow, we've now got seven, and that can only go away until we get more runway capacity. At the moment, the DFT do not seem to be discharging that role terribly effectively, and indeed their advice to the Davis Commission seems to actually be wrong, and I wonder whether, as the new consumer champion, you see this as a role for the CAA. I think it's extremely unlikely that um, I think it's extremely unlikely we would have that role um, for a number of reasons. I mean, first of all, the DFT themselves are very, very heavily constrained by European legislation now. Um, I, I know what you say about how effective they are in doing it, but actually, they've got very limited powers. A bit like when Howard was talking about. Um, 
uh, you know, being able to transfer uh, alliances from one location to another. Traffic distribution rules are no longer readily available to them. There are some constraints on that. Secondly, I think as a regulator that's focused on consumers, we are very nervous about too many interventions in that way. Actually, there is a very strong track record of people interrupting the market, and actually you end up with a relatively inefficient process if you do that too regularly. But fundamentally, it's not there for the DFT to use, and it's largely going to be a political decision. If you look at the last, the last route to benefit from that, I think you will find it's remarkably close to the um, constituency of the Chief Secretary to the Treasury. And of course, CAA, as you say, you're the consumer's champion, but you're the consumer's champion right through the UK. Yes. So, you know, the decision to go for a, a runway in the southeast, you've got to be very careful it doesn't adversely affect consumers of aircraft travel in other parts of the country. But that's right, because consumers have to pay for this, then we want it to be as efficiently utilised as possible. Which brings me on to that, you're from Newcastle. From Newcastle, yes. Uh, I was going to ask this question of um, Colin and Stuart earlier on, but I decided to save it for you. Uh, <laughs> it's um, your lucky it, day. It, it's, it's carrying on the, the discussion that, that, you, that, that you've just been having about the uh, impact of runway capacity on future landing fees for regional airports, mm. um, particularly access into Heathrow. And um, the picture that's painted by Colin is a different one to the picture painted by... Um, Stuart, and I just wondered what your view is on what impact it's likely to have. Well, um, we heard lots of numbers being banded around, didn't we, about um, what the charge is going to be, but they were all entirely spurious because the divisor which was, was missing, which is how many passengers are there going to be. Mm. It's a simple calculation. It's the cost of the scheme divided by the additional passengers who will travel as a consequence, or rather spread across the whole uh, number of passengers. So it can only be a guess. Well, it, it can be, I, I think it's pretty accurate predictions. I mean, airlines are very sophisticated models, airports too. But what we have to be confident is that where we put the capacity, there'll be people there to build. I, you, know, I, I, you can have a £50 billion scheme in a place that will actually got, develops many, many more passengers, and it will be more cheaper, more, pa more passengers than a £10 billion scheme that doesn't attract anybody. You, you have to look at the attractiveness of the proposition. Thank you very much indeed, Andrew. Thank you.